Hey, everybody, welcome back to this week in startups. We're doing another AI roundtable. And this is the best one ever. Vinny and Sunny join me again to demo chat GPT's new code interpreter. This was just released on Friday. We we're playing with it over the weekend. And we're going to play with it here on the show. We take a random a couple of CSVs that we grabbed off government websites, we upload it to chat GPT. And it takes this and acts like a data scientist and it starts doing analysis of these documents. It's incredible magic. Make sure uh, you listen to this episode with your teams. Because at your startup, you're probably wasting 10s of 1000s of dollars that this new tool is going to remove from your expenses. These rapid innovations AI are going to change the world. I've been talking about it multiple times per week here on This Week in Startups and on the All In podcast. I think people are going to become 30% more efficient uh, this year. But, but Sunny thinks I'm wrong. He thinks it's 300% or more. We get into it. I show you a bunch of details of some GPT stuff I did over the weekend and some stuff I'm doing in Python on a replit. It's going to be a great show. It might even blow your mind. Stick with us. This Week in Startups is brought to you by OpenPhone brings your team's business calls, texts, and contacts into one delightful app that works anywhere. Get 20% off your first six months at openphone.com slash twist. Coda is the all-in-one doc for teams. If you've got a stack of niche workflow tools, or if you're buried in docs and spreadsheets, Coda is the doc that brings it all together. Get a $1,000 startup credit by signing up at coda.io slash twist. And release. Large enterprises pose unique challenges for SaaS startups. Unlock customers with unique needs for private and single tenant hosting without the toil of DIY with release delivery. Get your first month free at release.com slash twist. Hey, everybody, welcome to another episode of This Week in Startups with me again, Vinny Lingham and Sunny Sandeep Madra. Uh, we were doing a crypto roundtable, boys, and AI has taken over all of our lives. Crypto still <laughs> seems like an important technology, but it does feel like the amount of energy putting into being put into AI startups, language models is 100x or 1000x what's happening in crypto. So we'll skate to where the puck is going uh, and continue our discussions about AI here. So this is our weekly AI roundtable. If you have ideas uh, for the producers here, producers at thisweekinstartups.com. If you see something interesting, uh, say something, email producers at thisweekinstartups.com. All right, so uh, let's get right into it. You shared a link with us, uh, Sunny, on the group chat that uh, some chat GPT users now have access to a code execution or code interpreter plugin. Uh, what is this and why is it important? Yeah, so this is really, really uh, big. And what it, what chat GPT has enabled, OpenAI has enabled, is the ability for um, um, the interface to run code. Mm. And what it's really, uh, what's interesting, and you can now input data um, via like an upload feature. Um, so one of the really cool examples that people are doing this weekend, this was just released on Friday, just goes to show you the pace is that you can take a spreadsheet, that spreadsheet can have data in it, you can upload it, and then you can basically have mm. a chat GPT do some basic data science for you. Um, and so it's really you know, the process to do that before would have been to, you know, either go get a data scientist or write a Python program. And so it does all of this in line in a very similar way to how we saw the plugins work. We're yeah. seeing that now for, um, you know, running code. And that code interpreter, if you were to just do a Google search right now for, if you do a Google search for uh, ChatGPT and you go into ChatGPT on the dropdown, you see... Uh, especially if you're paying the default, which is 3.5 uh, version of ChatGPT, GPT-4. And then you'll see some other things uh, like GPT-3.5 with browsing, which is in alpha, GPT-4 with browsing, that's in alpha, and then code interpreter, which is marked as alpha. And you see this all on the drop down menu. And if you happen to have applied to the plugins, which uh, I applied to and I've been using and I got my team on, you'll see plugins alpha. I think paying for ChatGPT, the 20 bucks a month, We'll get it there. So um, is Code Interpreter available to everybody, do you know? 
I think it's only available to those folks that have plugins enabled, ah. which means that they've been allowed into this very limited beta or alpha mm-hmm. group that are kind of developer centric or, or people that are, you know, real, um, you know, publishing stuff to the community to help educate everyone. So it's not widely available yet. Got it. And so an example of this might be what? Uh, and this is stuff you might ask a data scientist to do in Google Sheets or Excel previously, or to query an SQL database or something. Exactly. That that's normally how someone would deal with it. Yeah. So inside your organization, uh, Vinny, people are like, "Oh, we got this Google Sheet. Oh, we exported our Google Analytics. Oh, we downloaded some data. We got some, you know, client data. We've got we exported something from Salesforce or whatever tool we're using." Now the team has to go find somebody smart who is either in the accounting department, the data science department, or just happens to be good at hacking this stuff together. And this is something that civilians, the other 80% of people who work at a company, just don't know how to do. It would be too hard for them to do. You have that experience, I guess, in your startups as well, Vinny? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's definitely a lot easier to... I mean, it's it, it, you know, the barriers to do, using data science right now is coming down by the by the day. Mm. <laughs> you know, this is where it's democratizing data science. Like, I've got a friend who's a data scientist, and um, you know, I invested in his company, and he's been using data science models for years. And like, it's just, I think it's a game changer for them. I mean, they they some of the data science companies out there right now they they charge ridiculous amounts of money. I mean, we're talking like millions and millions of dollars to do data science for companies. And th- th- there's some big businesses out there. I think uh, one's Datadog, I think, and mm. there's a couple others. Um, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, OpenAI and ChatGPT has basically, you know, reduced the ability to do this, to, to you know, it, SMEs, enterprise individuals can do it. What I think is interesting, though, um, on a slight deviation here is Google has got access to so much company data to the Google suite. So if mm. you if you like run a startup and you're on Google, Google Drive, uh, you know, Google Docs, Google Docs Sheets, yeah. Google Sheets, everything. That information is in- incredibly powerful. So now Google just needs to take BARD and say, would you like to activate BARD on your company documents? And then, you know, create like a uh, you know, obviously have to figure out the privacy stuff and you know rights. I mean, but but basically, if you have access That's to that's already been done in an organization, right? No, no, like it's, generally it's speaking, the organization should have set their permission. So, um, well, well, so just keep this in mind, right? If Bard starts learning across the company, it needs to be able to partition the knowledge and not infer information sure. from that only you have access to. So, if I'm the so, HR department and I've got a bunch of yes. documents that only yes. the HR departments are, and then Correct. somebody in sales does a query, hey, how much do we pay our people internally? And yeah. what's their compensation? You don't want that coming up in the results. E- exactly. So that so is an important s- permissions so issue. Yes, but, 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 but if you're the CEO, you should have, you know, do you have access, access to, to everything? Someone? Do you have access to everything? Or do you have access to, and what about like if JKL has got a private doc uh, sheets in there that no one else actually, are you, are you allowed to see that? Or Of course. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the organization owns it. This is like a fallacy that some employees I, have that I I'm agree, on my I, like, I corporate account. Yeah. I, I, mean, I agree is, with you. Yeah. If it's, pers- but, if it's personal information, you shouldn't have it on the company's uh, servers anyway. Totally. I and am amazed company by information, that. It yeah. should not be, if it's company information, it should be available to your manager, yeah. your manager. Right, so manager, that's an important issue to whatever. flag. Um, uh, but, you know, just to, as a fair warning to everybody there who works at a company, everything you say on your email is saved for all eternity, your documents, your Slack for all eternity. Do not phone expect call, anything. Phone calls, as, phone calls as well. A lot of companies yes. record all calls incoming in. I mean, and some of it's compliance and some of it's just the default. When you leave a company, you assign the documents to the next person or to the CEO. So if you wrote your diary or your journal in your corporate account, I mean, wake up people, it's 2023. Don't do that because it's going to be indexed and then somebody's going to be able to pick it up. So uh, poor initiative flag. Stop using your personal phone for your startup in 2023. You have to stop doing this. It's such a common mistake that founders make. Open phone has totally rethought every detail of what a business phone should look like in 2023. And it's so affordable, you have no excuse. They make it super easy to get a business phone number for everybody on your team. It works through a beautiful web app on your phone or your desktop. And I can tell you it's amazing because our sales team and our ops teams use it daily recently found so much value using open phone for our angel summit communications 
Open Phone is the number one rated business phone on G2 for customer satisfaction. And Twist listeners are going to love it. Brian Jagger, he's the co-founder of a startup called Athlete. He tweeted the following. I'm literally cash flow positive from listening to This Week in Startups for Listener Deals. And he explains that he previously got open phone money from this incredible discount that they give to This Week in Startups founders. And he says, I'm not paid to say that. I don't know Jason. Pure honest feedback and appreciation. And you know what? I love to hear this because there's so many people who listen to this podcast who are founders and you need to use these tools. But hey, listen, you, you might be uh, cash constrained or you might want to put that cash into your product. Open phone is already affordable at a starting price of only $13 per user per month. But Twist listeners can get 20% off any plan for your first six months at openphone.com slash twist. And if you have existing numbers with another service, no problem. Open Phone will port them over at no extra cost. So head to openphone.com slash twist to start your free trial and get 20% off. Do you have an example to show here, Sonny, if people are watching at youtube.com slash this weekend or on Spotify or the video yeah, feed? Let, like, let, let's uh, let's uh, just let's go open for it, up yeah. GPT-4 here. And I have okay, some stuff so here, that I was playing I'm, with this weekend that got interesting too that I'll share. Okay, so I'm going to share here. Give me a second. All right, and we're doing this live because we just got the data set from our producer. Okay, so we're inside of uh, ChatGPT here, and we're going to upload this electric vehicle data set. Ah, and that, when you said send a message, there's a link on the right there. And if you, on the left of send a message, and that's where you upload from? Yeah, right? right here. There's like a little, like a, there was a, a yeah, see this little plus icon and normally the, um, ah, so you can see the first I thing. I didn't know that. Is that only yeah, for? So that is only for the code interpreter. Got it. And so show just so people can see the interface here, because we, we have never done this, but could just hit a new chat there and let me just show people the interface and then just describe that for folks. Um, okay, so hold on. Let's chat, go. Um, you click new chat in the top left. You hit this down arrow key. Now you can see all the different um items plugins default etc so you got to sports cast this a little bit so people see it and then it gives you a little description of what it is um yep. and how good it is and like a sort of internal rating of what it does but you picked cold out code interpreter interpreter correct got it all right and then you hit and then, the plus and so key. We, and now you know this is about uh i think a 29 meg file and so it's going to take uh, you know a few seconds to upload here. I see that, yeah. And so now yeah. what it's going to do, and none of us have really seen this file yet, which is fascinating. It is fascinating. I'm, and by so the way, you, doing this alongside of you. Yeah, so this is the code. So it's generated this code. This is Python code here, J. Cal, you were asking about this weekend to read that uh -huh. file. And it's still generating and it's understanding. Now, it's, now you can see here, it's starting to tell us, hey, the data has been rolled into a data frame. And from the first few rows, we can understand that this is the data. So we're going to let this just let this complete. And I'll tell you the next, the next piece, which what Vinny was talking about a second ago was like, you know, where you'd normally have to go get a data scientist and so uh, to do something like this. And so, and it, you know, throws some things up here and it says, okay, so it's done. So then my next question is going to be this. Well, let's describe what conduct, it showed there. It's loaded the data and it says, oh, it looks like the data contains VIN, location, model year, make vehicle type msrp and li department of licensing vehicle id some locations utility okay. and some census tracking so what nick get, producer nick gave us was the electric vehicle population data and uh, it correct. figured out what's in there and it's reflecting that back to you in plain english correct it is and it's saying hey i'm ready to do something it's loaded mm -hmm. it what i'm showing here is the prompt where it's loaded it into uh like a, a python library called pandas which is mm -hmm. what a lot of data scientists would use to start analyzing data. So there was a, and a little showed, carrot there that said, show the work. So after it uploaded yeah. it, when it finished work, it asked you to do that. And fascinating, when it did yours, for me, it did a different response to the same data, which is really yeah. interesting. Like ChatGP4 yeah. told me, the data set contains information about electric vehicles, with each row representing a specific electric vehicle. The columns in the data set are as follows, and it did it one through 10. It actually gave me a list yeah. of them, which is yeah, really it, like a totally more helpful response. That's very fascinating yeah. that and we had two different experiences. And that's sort of the nature of L LLMs that can happen. But this next question, which I'm putting down in the prompt, so I'll read to everyone, mm -hmm. says, can you conduct whatever visualizations and descriptive analysis you think would help me understand the data? Because I have this mm -hmm. producer Nick wow. sent us this file. And so now 
let's see what it does in this next phase here. And so <clears throat> what it's starting to tell us is we'll look at the following aspects of the data. Distribution of electric vehicle types, um, you know, uh, battery electric vehicles versus plug-in electric vehicles, that's BEV versus PHEV, top 10 most popular electric vehicle makes and models, distribution of the vehicles by year, geographic summary of the vehicles, and summary statistics of the range and base MSRP. And that's okay. all, it's, it's doing all of that just based on this question, which was, can you conduct whatever visualizations and descriptive analysis you think would be helpful to understand this data. And so now it's doing the work to basically do those five things for us. And again, What's very interesting you can imagine about that is that you did a very generic question, which is you asked the CEO question. All right, thanks for the data, yes. data scientist in a meeting. <laughs> uh, wh wh why do I care? Just g get to the point. What, 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 what did you learn yeah. by studying the data? And it, it, it's basically just starting with some general ideas here to get you started and you could pick one to double click on. Yes, correct. And so it's now doing the work and what you can see here, oh my again, God. like, you know, yeah. And Describe so what, what you're what seeing. Remember, are, imagine people are listening, sending some yeah. sports casting. Okay, so, so it, it, it gave us five uh, examples uh, of things that to look at the data. So the first is the distribution. A chart of, of the distribution. A different, yeah, a, exactly. Of a chart that shows us the distribution between battery electric vehicles and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. And Got this it. is a visualization. It would have taken someone a few minutes to, you know, maybe 30 minutes to generate this chart in PowerPoint. And it's been generated for us automatically. And it shows us that the distribution is almost five to one here, right? Maybe four, four to one in terms of there's way more battery electric vehicles and plug-in electric vehicles, hmm. according to the data set that we were given. Okay. The next chart is we're going to look at the 10 most popular electric vehicle makes. And we see here that Tesla is a clear leader with Nissan at number two, then Chevrolet, then Ford. And we see a Incredible. visualization that of a chart there. Um, next, we're going to look at not by make, but we're going to look by model. And we can see here that the most popular model is the Model 3, then the Model Y, then the Leaf and so forth, if you uh, look at this chart. And then when we look at by year, uh, and obviously, you know, this, we're only partway into 2023, we can see that the by year, the distribution of electric vehicles has generally been increasing with a little bit of a slowdown in 2019 and 2020, and a pickup back in 21 and a huge jump back in 2022. And we're only, you know, a quarter, a little bit more than a quarter Stimmy away to 2023. Would be my interpretation. But what's interesting here is <laughs> now that you start to see some of these things, you could actually ask ChatGPT, why is there a spike? Uh, yeah. But you could just do that in another window with ChatGPT4. What's your takeaway Correct. here, Vinny, just to bring you in on the conversation? I mean, I'm I'm going to start using this to analyze my wine collection. <laughs> Fantastic. You have no, a can, CSV? Can, Upload it. What do we tell me no, about it? No, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to go into pull it right now and see if I can go, you know, come up with some some train stats. Let's, you know, recommend other wines for me. Let's see what it comes do, up you with. Had, do you have plugins? Go do it. We'll show it on the air if you're comfortable. What's interesting here also is based on the visualization and summary statistics, here are some key insights from the data. It actually uh, wrote some of these and it said yep. top 10 most popular electric vehicles is 0.3. Tesla Model 3 is the most popular electric vehicle model followed by Nissan Leaf, etc. So you start getting into some really interesting concepts here. And for mine, I let me um, share mine. This will be very interesting to do, if I may. Uh, Oh, did you have another one you wanted to do, um, Sonny? No, no, no. I, that, okay. That's what, you know, I wanted to just show that capability because that's the yeah. new uh, feature they unlock is uploading the data set, which I know you've been thinking about a little bit, Jay Cal, because you have a lot of spreadsheets, I know, in your I got business. a lot of spreadsheets I got. Can you see my uh, screen now? Right. Okay, yes. great. So I did the same thing. I uploaded the same file. But what you'll see here is that um, if you're seeing it, Remember I said it gave me just a list of what are the columns. So it gave me the list of columns. And then I asked a slightly different question. What are the three most interesting yep. trends in this data? And it said to identify interesting trends in the electric vehicle population data, we need to analyze various aspects of the data set. Pretty generic. Let's explore the following three trends. Electric vehicle, vehicle adoption over time. Most popular electric vehicles make some models. Distribution of electric vehicle types like yours. And then it gave me a couple of charts. It did a different design style, uh, which is weird. But electric vehicle adoption over time, instead of using a histogram, it did a uh, a line chart. Line chart. Mine. It did the same thing, most popular electric vehicles, and then it did the same thing, the distribution. And it, too, gave me uh, some highlights here. And uh, 
what I could do here is uh, an interesting one. Let's see if this works. Please give me the same analysis, but take out all Tesla models. And if it gets this right, that's like game over, right? Because this is something you might ask. You're like, okay, we know Tesla is running the table on everything, but I, I don't care that the, I mean, we all know Model 3 outsells everything because it's, you know, the greatest, well, Model Y, I think is the greatest car ever made. But those two, but let's just take out all Teslas and see if it does that, right? So now you're starting to yep. be able to do things with data. I mean, it's just, yep. this is just stunning uh, what can be done here. Um, I was over the weekend uh, trying to do things here inside of it. I'll show, well, I can't leave the screen. It's one of the problems with chat GPT-4. I think if you leave the screen, it will uh It can pause. stop, yeah, sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I guess they're It'll trying to get or, yeah, people to not generating. do this, but all of these little blocking and tackling things will be worked out over time, uh, like doing multiple queries simultaneously, like just for the love of God, uh, Greg, and and uh, give me a corporate account here. Let me put all my people into chat GP4. Let all of this data be shared in a common repository. I need multiplayer mode for chat GPT4. And I would pay $200 a person per month. I would pay $4,000 a month, $50,000 a year. Right now I'm paying $20 across everybody in my organization. And hopefully everybody in my company is actually doing this now. If you hear my voice, I've been like tweeting about just, oh, wow, here we go. Uh, let's see. Uh, electric vehicles over time without Tesla. That's interesting. Uh, and then the models. Uh, yeah, wow, it nailed it. Most popular electric vehicles yep. makes without Tesla models. And you see a very more even distribution in the chart. Nissan, Chevrolet, Ford, BMW are one, two, and three, but it's not as spiky because you're taking out. And then you see here that actually the hybrid, since I guess Tesla doesn't produce a hybrid versus battery electric vehicles becomes much more normalized. So here, yep. peak sales in 2022, it looks like is 14,000. Well, because 23 is not complete yet, right? So yeah, that's why it's Yeah, but if I go to the off, yeah. last complete year, 22. it was 25,000 yep. over 25. Yep. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Number of EVs, would that be 25 million? What is the left hand here? No, it can't be 25 million. It would be 2.5 million, maybe. A million. Or, yeah, probably that makes more sense. Yeah. So it's, it, it is like, yeah, it says 14,000, but it actually means add uh, probably two zeros. So 1.4 million. So you're just taking out a lot of vehicles, probably. Yeah, Tesla sold what looks like 500,000. Is that right? No, 50,000. Is this somebody in America? They sold Close to a million. Yeah, this might be U.S. because it was. This uh, might be just U.S. Yeah, it, it had state, had state vehicle no, and other what's information. Yeah, and city state what's what's, called? what's yeah, the time is, frame? For, yeah. What's the time frame for this? Is it, what, is it like a year, a month? What's no, since two thousand? Back a few years. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. the data yeah. was. I mean, this is just incredible. I mean, you you just see like we're lifelong technologists. We know how much time this kind of takes mm. uh, to do this kind of stuff. Well, and this but imagine you is, take your website information or your podcast data. And then you start slicing and dicing that now. Yep. And imagine the work and the number of people it took and the time it took. Mm -hmm. You, Jason, <clears throat> would want that answer right away. Where are the listeners from? You know, right. which ones, you know, all the different, uh, you know, you're going to go after this, Jason, and download all your data and going to be uploading it immediately is my guess. Right. Yeah. And I mean, well, well I mean, does it, uh, it doesn't need to have a, a developer account for that. Or, like, what do you need to have to be able to use this? Right now, you have to be um, a, have a developer account, and you need to be uh, let in by OpenAI. This is the year you need to perform, you need to be focused, and I want your startup firing on all cylinders. And how are you going to do that? You're going to use Coda. Coda helps you do more with less. In Coda, your team can work on entire projects from start to finish. That's right, one product. You have everything you need in one place. We're in the efficiency revolution. You have to do more with less. And right now is the perfect time for you to jump in and learn about all the amazing features that Coda has. Coda is the doc that brings it all together. And it's efficient and it's fast. We use Coda at this very podcast to track my J trades. If you just go to jtrading.com, it'll take you to a gorgeous Coda page of all my J trades. What an amazing product. It's always advancing. The templates are next level. But here's the important call to action. You can operate and collaborate in one place to get your projects done faster. Take advantage of this special limited time offer just for startups. Sign up today at coda.io slash twist, and you will get the $1,000 startup credit on your first statement. That's right. coda.io slash twist for a 
thousand dollar sign up credit and this offer is so generous i want you to take advantage of it right now because i don't know how long this absurdly generous offer from coda will exist coda.io slash twist for one thousand dollars in sign up credits right now there is a wait list for plugins and um but this Yo, it's is com it's so compute intensive jake the, jake oh, this goes back to the whole gpu shortage problem right this is compute intensive if they gave every one of the 100 million users plus access to yep. this it would just fry the system they don't have the capacity for it honestly like i I, um, I think we're getting to the point where this is so valuable for organizations that Azure uh, and AWS should just start offering your own, uh, what is it, A100 is the NVIDIA? The, 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 I mean, Amazon's working on it, but it's not that simple just to like spin these things up. It's going to take a couple of years to get... Oh, I, I mean, mean, just the, racking the, them is going to take time. Producing no, no, them, they, you have to available. basically... Jekyll, yeah. there's a shortage. There's a chip no, no, shortage no, out there. I, right I absolutely understand. But what I, I'm saying eventually was the word I use, Vinny. Sure. Eventually... Sure. I think sure. organizations are going to start provisioning their yeah. own GPUs for this because it's so valuable. And if you told me right now, an A100, you know, cost $10,000, would you like me to sell you one for 20000 to have it in your organization today to start doing this? I mean, it's a de minimis amount of money compared to the value created. I just asked it another question. And I was like, uh, <laughs> which states had the most growth in 2021 and 2022? Uh, and it said, based on this, the electric vehicles dates 2021, here are the two top states with the most gro growth. Do you want to take a guess? Which states had the most growth, percentage-wise? Without California? No, it included California. California and New York. No, California I said percentage York, growth, though. A percentage. Well, percentage. No, no, actually, I said which states had the most growth in 2021 and 22, interpreted that as percentage, not raw numbers. Okay. So it is, in Te fact, Texas. giving me... I'll th I'd say Texas. Okay, which are... Okay, keep going. I'm not going to say that right. And Texas and probably maybe Florida. Maybe what do you got? Washington, Seattle. Yeah. Oh, I'd say well, I'd say Seattle, yeah, like you Washington. You're and... smart. Sorry. Uh, uh, what a number of minutes in. F bomb. Um, <laughs> Washington is number one. They grew from eighteen that to twenty-seven thousand, a growth of nine thousand EVs, fifty percent growth. And Texas was number two. Uh, yeah. Actually, it got that wrong. It says number of EVs in 2021, three, number in 2022, four. It's, it's Washington State data specifically. It's in Washington State. Oh, this data set? Yes, this data set's Washington State data from WashingtonState.gov. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay, so what we're looking at has nothing to do uh, with by state. Okay, that's why the numbers were low. Okay, great. Yeah, what I'm looking I'm looking at the CSV though. It does have uh, all kinds of counties and cities. Like I see San okay, Diego. Okay, leave it all in. We just took by the way, for the yeah. folks listening, we just took a random data set the producers found and just yeah. uploaded it. So we found this data set. It's, doesn't have perfect information and so just understand like the <laughs> we're we're this is kind of an interesting use case. Somebody sends you a CSV, you don't know what it is and it starts interpreting it for you. All right. Well, producer Nick who is an exceptional producer. Uh, you hear people talk about producer Nick on All In and here at This Week in Startups. Did a wonderful job producing today. And he said, uh, explain to the audience what you found and what you did while we were live on air. And yeah, so I day. found a website where they have a bunch of uh, CSV files from government data, one of which mm -hmm. was the one that you just saw previously, the Washington yep. State EV data. Um, I also found one which has something to do with the topic that we're uh, covering today about FDIC bank failures, which was from the actual FDC, FDIC.gov website, which you can see mm -hmm. right here. Pretty amazing. I uploaded it. It found a formatting error on the CSV mm -hmm. file. And I was about to look up how to fix it. And ChatGPT just fixed it itself. Found a Unicode error. Okay. Yeah, that's common. And then just fixed it. Pretty crazy. Perfect. Um, then it's, I asked it, what are the most interesting ways to visualize this data? Gave me some examples. I said, okay, do that. Um, and here you go. Okay, so let's take a look here. Um, it said bank closures by year, bank closures by state, top acquiring institutions, fascinating. Heat map of bank closures, timeline, heat map of bank closures, timeline of bank closures. This is fascinating. So let's scroll down here and see what charts it came up with. Uh, again, finding errors and fixing them, scroll down. Now let's proceed with creating visualizations. I'll start with bank closures by year, bank closures by state, type acquiring, top acquiring institutions. This is fascinating. And obviously, we see by year, scroll down 160 or so in uh, the financial crisis, and then it slowly went down. But what's interesting about that, Vinny, if you look at it, if you notice that the bank closures that started in 2008 peaked in 2010. So it was a full 
two plus year process of peaking and then trailing off, you're going to have some per year, but it still took, a f- it was basically four years of bank closures. Well, well, so just remember, so a lot of this was back in the days we had a, we, we've had a lot of like the smaller banks being consolidated up and then they passed yep. the laws on, on the bigger banks as well. So, yes. so it's unlikely for us to see the same sort of tail right now mm-hmm. because yes. all the small banks have been cleaned up. However, if you look at the latest data and just the, the, the amount of money that's in the banking sector has blown up in the past two or three months, out of like five banks, we've had um, more AUM blow up, I think, in 2023 then in 28 and 9 and 10 and 11, like the whole banking crisis, we in the past three months, we've had like more. By a, like by dollar amount. By dollar saying. amount. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, 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 yeah. like Washington Mutual uh, mm-hmm. versus Silicon Valley Bank versus First Republic, et cetera. Like the scale is so different right now because these banks are yes. so big. It's interesting also about what Nick found here is like, you can see some of these didn't have acquirers. They just shut down. Some of them, uh, you know, were acquired by State Bank and Trust Company, First Citizens Bank, Ameris Bank, U.S. Bank, NA. So just fascinating ways to look at data. If you're listening to this in your organization, there's going to be two possibilities of what happened. This is what I've been trying to explain to people. Maybe I have to go back to based Cal and start using all caps on Twitter. But I am finding that 30% of what I do can be done inside of chat 4 today. I'm finding my producers, and you saw Nick pull up his thing there, and I saw questions in his thing that were questions I w- was asking during live this week in startups. So when I'm doing the show, the producers are looking up data. They're using chat GPT-4 all day long, um, and even during shows. So this, to me, is what I would implore people to try to understand right now. Smart people who are using this are taking... I would say between 10 and 50% of their job in automating it, and then they're quiet quitting, or they're doing more wa- work, and they're going to be more effective in their organizations, or their boss is going to figure this out, and everybody's going to get more work done. And instead of hiring, people are going to start firing and getting more done. So just think about gains, 30% gains across an organization of, let's take my investment firm, about 20 people. That's the equivalent of having 26 people. So one of two things is either going to happen. If you had 20 people, you're either going to go down to 14 and save that money, or you're going to act like a 26 person organization or something in between. That's how management thinks. Now for my team, (laughs) we're doing a great job. I just want you to become 30% more efficient so we don't have to hire more people. But other people are going to look at this, Vinny, and they're going to take a different approach, which is, okay, we have how many data scientists? Great. Half their requests are not necessary. They're going to be done by chat GPT-4. People are not going to need them. So we just get rid of half the data scientists. Now, take a moment to think about what I just said. There's there's been a competition for data scientists. Some organizations say, how many of these data scientists do we need? Well... I mean, well, I, I'd say, I'd, I'd say right now, JK, we, we, we probably have, don't have enough on a global basis. So I don't think there's going to be a shortage of data scientists anywhere in some So they may be reallocated, like from companies that have seven down to three, and then those four go elsewhere that's needed. So I think you probably need fewer data scientists per company, but there's still companies out there that's going to need, that never thought of having data scientists because they just didn't have, the you know mm. the, but I mean like you still have to pay for the licenses right for yes. the software that they use which is like millions of dollars a year so now now the cost of the software has come down dramatically you still need the people to operate it because you know some people just need to be focused on the stuff and a lot of companies the data is in multiple databases and spreadsheets and it's all it's very disparate you still have to build data warehouses that have all the information etc so it's not as simple as that I think that um, is I mean, it not as simple as that. No, I, I don't think so. I, I think in, in a world where everything was highly efficient and everything was run properly, yeah, maybe. But we're so, I mean, the, the, the gap right now between the haves and the have-nots in, in data I, science is very, very I don't very know, big. Sonny. I might disagree. This weekend, I started uh, learning Python. You already called me Sonny right now. <laughs> Vinny. <laughs> no, I was going to Sonny. Uh, uh, I was going to uh, throw to Sonny. <laughs> I thought you did too. Pottery. I was like, oh my God. No, oh, you also I, thought so. <laughs> I was going to throw to Sonny. It, uh, listen, you guys are Sonny and Vinny. You're two of my best friends. The names are different <laughs> by one letter. Sonny two, and Vinny. Two letters. Sonny, two, Vinny? Two letters. <laughs> oh, right. The I. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. I, I'm, I had a long weekend. I, I had yeah, the kids yeah. alone. Anyway, I am going to disagree. Vinny, 
And Sonny, I want you to reflect on this. You and I were chatting. We we're trying to get together over the weekend to do a little code jam, but we, you know, yeah. kids, whatever, got in the way. But I started Warriors on a game. Warriors Six game. game. Nick's lost. Warriors won. Incredible. Uh, shout out Steph Curry. Replit uh, is like a coding environment. So I just signed up and I started taking their Python course. I was like, oh my God, this takes so much concentration. I'm never going to be able to do this. Like, this is not going to be my chosen career, but I do want to see how far I can take it because they have a bounty thing on Replit. And I put a bounty yep. up and then I explained in details, I'd like an order GPT agent that checks our database of already contacted companies by URL. So these are startups we've talked to. So we say, hey, com.com and uber.com are in the database already. We don't need to call them. Then finds new startups on Crunchbase Products Hunt and LinkedIn and sends them a semi-automated email from one of our researchers introducing our venture fund. Acceptance criteria. App is able to find a recently updated Crunchbase profile within a specific criteria, geography investment stage, and sends an email to that founder. Pretty simple, right? And I put this yep. up for 27,000 cycles, I guess they call them on uh, Replit. Shout out to the team at Replit that emailed me immediately after I talked about it on the pod. Um, and I put it up for $270. I got four applications. And as you can see here, um, uh, one person says, Jason have built this in the past and building for a few funds. So I'm not the only one thinking like this would love to chat more about it. you can check my GitHub LinkedIn for resources. And he's done three bounties. Uh, Cribes, Jake, Al, I'm a fan of the pods. I've read your book, dumb luck. I'm poking around Replit and see what all the fuss about. I stumble on your bounty. Regarding your bounty, I'd like to help, uh, ask you to flesh out your criteria. Yada, yada, yada. I do either of these free as long as we can dedicate pretty much the time to you coaching me on my personal journey. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't like taking free stuff. But anyway, my point here, Vinny, yeah. and then I'll go to Sunny, um, is I am the CEO of the company. I'm the GP, the general partner of the fund. I'm looking at this and I'm like, I wonder how long it is between when I can describe something to a bounty program and have code sent to me and then I run it myself just like I am using chat GPT four. And I feel like I'm on a collision course, Sunny, between using chat GPT four with plugins and uploading stuff myself, and then working with the developer community to write tiny little scripts for $270. That at a $50 salary or $40 salary or $60 salary for let's say an operations person in our organization. You know, that would take five hours, I can basically take what is 50 hours a week of work in our company, two researchers doing 50 hours a week of work, $1,500 a week, maybe I don't know, $2,000 a week fully baked with benefits, $100,000 a year of work, and I can just automate it for 270 bucks. Am I yeah. crazy? Or is um, this going to change the world? No, I mean, you're you're we're 90 days away. Jake, <laughs> we're 90 <laughs> days away at, at the pace we're going at right now. Because you know what you put in here is mostly just doable. Mm. and um and it, it's like i said we're entering a world where um the core framework is being absorbed by open ai and so if you just saw what we did um that they're gonna open like they're taking their they're taking their time right now from a safety perspective that um the code interpreter that we were just playing with jkl mm -hmm. doesn't reach out to the internet just yet but we know that they have browsing capabilities because there's other plugins that can browse Yes. As soon as they allow code to go out to the internet, yes. Which, you know, they've controlled that. It's not like they don't know how to do it. Then you have that problem solved right inside code interpreter. It's crazy. Uh, because you would describe your problem inside code interpreter and say, here's my spreadsheet, go to Crunchbase. And so the same I thing would, you did in the replit, you'll I, do I inside inside there. Developer talent is the most precious resource for B2B startups. You know that. And you want your developers focused on product, not on compliance, right? When you're selling B2B software to large enterprises, you need to jump through a ton of security and compliance hoops. And one of those hoops is large customers need you to host your software on their cloud. And you need to build that out on a per customer basis. Think about that. So B2B startup companies constantly face this dilemma. Do you keep developers focused on infrastructure? which could hurt your product velocity, or do you keep them focused on the product velocity, which would then delay your ability to close large customers? Well, I have a solution for you, and it's called release delivery. What release delivery does is it automates the creation of enterprise class app delivery for private clouds 
and single tenant applications. Basically, this lets you deliver your software seamlessly into any customer environment. This will unlock a ton of revenue potential for you and release delivery will put all the tedious stuff on autopilot for you. So you can turn your ideas into apps and deploy those apps quickly and flexibly into their clouds. So here's your call to action. Let release show you the power of release delivery and get your first month free at release.com slash twist. What a domain name. R-E-L-E-A-S-E dot com slash twist. It's up to $10,000 in value at release.com slash twist. I would, I would agree with Sonny on this. I mean, guys, this is, this is the fifth generation language. Like we, we, you know, we never really got to it. This is natural language programming. Like everyone's a programmer now. You just, you just need to be able to speak English at this point to be able to do it. And even not even English, other languages as well. ChatGPT can translate for you. So as long as you can, I mean, if you you think about it, like, you know, language is code, (laughs) you know, like natural language is code. And we just, we had to create this layer where, where digital, uh, you know, digital mach- you know, software programs and machines could interpret what we're saying accurately. And because the human brain is so complex, the so language is a very complex thing for us. But machines that we, we've had to instruct machines based on a very limited number of words, you know, functions that we have that you know, was written. And now it's fully expansive. Like now you have the entire English vocabulary that you can use and the machine understands what you mean. You can be extremely precise in what you're saying to it as well. Whereas in the past, like you'd have to write functions to do certain things, it basically now understands every single word in the English dictionary to a very, very deep level. And every single word becomes, you know, effectively like somewhat of a function or, or describer or something. Um, so like, you, you know, I posted a tweet, I think yesterday, we will pull it up and I, I think this is a very important point that we should, we should probably touch on, um, today and get your, your, your views on this. Um, I, I think that, that, you know, in the next cycle, so we're in a we're in a bear cycle right now, right? We're or we're heading to one, or whatever you want to call it. Like, obviously, we, we you know we may not be in a recession. I think we are in a recession. For what I'm seeing, I'm seeing the signs of a recession already. Um, the next cycle that we go through is either a depression or it's a recovery and a boom, right? So whatever you want to you know however you want to define the next cycle. Regardless, I think we're heading for deflation in a big way. And I think that this will become the number one driver of deflation. I think you're exactly correct. What's going to happen is massive efficiency will come to the companies that get on this early. Then what will end, you know, the uh, if you're running a company right now, you should just give everybody the tool, ask them to show you what they did with it. And if you have 10 people in your department, if seven people use the tool and three people don't, you should fire the three people who don't use the tool. I know this sounds crazy. But this is exactly what I saw happen in the early 90s. We put PCs on people's desks. Some people literally did not want a PC on their desk. They wanted their secretary to have the PC. And and those people lasted, I think, you know, less than a decade in corporate America. And that was back then when, you know, you got to keep your job for a long time. There wasn't as much turnover for boomers. But there were boomers. Yep who were like literally when I was installing computers in the early 90s who were like, yeah, just I don't want the computer. You can don't put it on my desk, put it on this like little cubby over here in my in my law office and my assistant will do it. And they never logged in. And those people got phased out. They were relationship people. If you're not using this every day, you're you're literally a dinosaur. Uh, you're literally a, dis- a dinosaur. I, that's my belief. So you're exactly correct. This will be make every company 30, 40, 50 percent more efficient. And then what you have to ask yourself is, are there enough problems in the world that your company addresses for you to solve to generate revenue in a capitalist society? I believe there are decades of problems left. I don't think that this is going to result in uh, a UBI, universal basic income, where all the jobs are done. I think humans are going to be creative and find more things to do. But I literally believe efficiency of 5% gains per year for humans, let's say if everybody got, maybe let's say everybody got 10%. And every year, every seven years, people doubled their efficiency. I think what we're going to see is everybody's going to become 10% more efficient, like a month, or let's say a quarter, which means every seven quarters, every year and nine months, people are going to be twice as efficient. Uh, what do you say, Sonny? Well, I think there's a great example, J. Cal, and I've seen it, but uh, Nick, if we can pull it up in terms of efficiency. So um, this is someone who's working on a do not pay plugin. Oh, Josh Brown, he's been on the program. Yeah, yeah. 
No, there you go. So maybe Bill, Jake this Howell, is just you know, Josh Browder is Bill Browder who wrote the book Red Notice, his son. He's an entrepreneur and mm. he has Do Not Pay as the name of the company. He's been on the podcast and his whole thing was to help you like um get out of like um reoccurring subscriptions, etc. But he's also a So let's do a reaction before. thing, Jake. Why okay. don't you read this? Because you've seen it, so go for it. I haven't seen this. So what did it what did it say here? Okay. So, so th this is, you know, do not pay. It's an app on top of a uh, chat GPT leveraging it. It goes, chat, ask, how can I help you? He says, find me money. Is it connect? The uh, app says connect your bank account. Uh, yep. He connects account. And then it uh, finds the subscriptions that this person ah, is paying. LinkedIn, it obviously learns that. Whatever. And yeah. then it says, what do you want yeah, to do? Disney Which Plus, ones would you like to cancel? LinkedIn. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So let's go to the next spot. Incredible. Okay, and in right. this, he says, first using do not pay at Plaid Connection, I had. It scanned all uh, about 10,000 bank transactions. Okay. So it found $80.86 leaving his account every single month and offered to cancel, uh, offered to cancel those. Great. All right, let, let's keep scrolling. Okay. Then the bots basically got working mailing letters in the case of Jim's, uh -huh. right? And it used a uh, USPS um, API. Um, and chatted with the agents to basically start working on the cancellation. And so, um, like we, we can scan through this and we'll maybe drop the link in the notes, but the beauty here is going back to efficiency. Mm. Think about the time and effort. I, I, there's one last example. There, if you can go back there, uh, Nick, where it actually found a bill for a Wi-Fi connection and huh. he, it, uh, it turned around and asked, Hey, was that, um, did the Wi-Fi work properly? When he said no, it drafted a letter to send to, you know, GoGo or whoever the Wi-Fi company was uh, mm -hmm. asking for a refund for that, for that. And we, we all experienced that where we pay for it and it yep. doesn't work or it's bad. Yep. And basically, yeah. And so uh, we very let it similarly go start negotiation it, process yeah, to yeah. cancel that and get a refund. Yeah. And then similarly, it started a negotiation process for with Comcast. It's just, that's what I'm saying, Jake, how we're, these are apps that are being built on top of the technology. Incredible. So we are almost where you're talking about. As I said, less than 90 days away from incredible yeah. things happening for us, which then aligns to the deflationary argument. It's definitely going to be super deflationary. If you hear my voice, you know, like, and you're not using this and you're not getting up to speed on it, man. Um, yeah. You're not really following how fast this is. I started playing with, um, I'm giving a speaking gig on Wednesday uh, in Laguna down in the Orange County, um, doing my paid speaking gig thing. It's a corporate gig, and I'm talking about travel. And so I started uh, testing some, uh, I was like, you know, in this luxury hotel kind of situation, I won't say which one, um, okay. but let me share my screen here. Uh, so I started using the GPT-4 with browsing, browsing. Uh, web browsing. I don't know if you've played with this, but it doesn't work very well. I had said on All In and Chamath and Sachs laughed about this, that, hey, you're going to need to start citing your sources and then getting permission from them, et cetera, or else this thing is going to become gnarly. And all these lawsuits have already been filed. But when you uh, hear, I said, what are the major trends in luxury hotel travel? And it started to browse. And I guess it did a search and, and it said, search major trends in luxury hotels 2023. It found this link from a c website EHL. And then it read the content, yep, it got a bunch yep. of failures, it's not working very well, their web crawler is terrible, or it's really taxed, I don't know what's going on, my team today has been playing with the web crawler, but it only found this one, and then it basically just cribbed it. So now you can kind of see what's happening with ChatGPT4, it is cribbing a lot of data and just rewriting it, um, and then it does some thinking on top well, Jake, of it, I want to I want to cl clarify something, okay, this is... Um, so in the case when you're uh, without the plugin, you're asking for something, then the, the cribbing is not occurring. And I think that's a discussion that's happened before. In this particular case, you're asking chat GPT to go look for something with the browser mm -hmm. plugin. So then it will crib. It's two very yes. different use cases that we have to be aware yeah. of here. So anyway, this EHL insights had written this. Um, and, you know, you can see it basically took what they had on their website and it summarized it a little bit better. And then way down here, it gave a, a citation. You see that 12? It gave a little yeah, tiny 12, citation. Yeah. Um, and then I said, which hotel chains are known for having the best hotel workspaces? None of them offer dedicated work desk and high speed internet over ethernet connections. And it started browsing the web. It's actually doing it right now because it failed so many times. 
But I want to show you another uh, one I did here. And uh, this one was a uh, fascinating. And um, I said, what are the major trends in luxury hotels? And it gave me um, up to September 2021. This is without doing web searching, personalization, sustainability, wellness, authenticated experience, smart technology, blending home, blending work and leisure, unique design and architecture, multi generational appeal, privacy and exclusivity partnerships. So I said, which three of these are the most important for maximizing a hotel's loyalty and revenue? So I'm asking it to think, you know, a bit here. Mm, yep. And uh, it said personalization, smart technology and authentic experiences. And I was like, huh, the first two definitely authentic experiences. I don't know if that's actually like culturally immersive activities, genuine connections to the destination. I was like, I don't know. This feels a little woke to me. Not back to woke say, GPT. I was about to say, I was about to say, on the tip of my tongue, I was about to say that it's woke GPT. <laughs> so I was like, please give me 10 examples of how a luxury hotel might personalize a hotel guest's experience. So I just went after the personalization. And this was incredible. Like, I, and I don't know if where it's getting all this from, like, is it from its web crawl, you know, but it said pre arrival communication, customized welcome and amenities like a favorite drink or snack, tailored room setup, um, oh. like temperature, preferred lighting, curated experiences, personalized dining options, customized spa treatments, dedicated concierge service, flexible room configurations, tailored in room entertainment, uh, personalized turndown service. I said, you know what? Expand that list to 25 ideas. And it just went to town, you know, and yeah. customized mini bar. I'm like, well, that's a great idea. I I've never experienced I've, a customized I've, I've mini bar. I've had, that, I've had that idea before personally. <laughs> personalized honest, fitness yeah. and wellness programs, uh, customized transportation options, customized bedding and linens. I've heard about that. Actually, Chamath has that at uh, the peninsula where yeah. they have yep. CP pillowcases with his initials yeah. on them. Uh, so he had talked about that pet friendly personalization, uh, scent experiences. That's dumb, but interesting. Um, personalized communication. They do that channels. in Vegas. They do that in Vegas. Yeah. Communicate with guests through their yeah. preferred channels, such as text, email, or phone. That's actually a really important one. Some people, everybody's got a different one. Um, so then I was like, okay, well, let's take this to the next level. And I said, let's, let's see if we can set up a scenario where we tell it, you know, to pretend it's something. I said, you are the CEO of a hotel chain. And you're building a hundred room hotel, take these top trends and write a three paragraph, 400 word description of this new hotel, follow that with 10 bullets about what makes this hotel unique. And it does this introducing the premier destination for discerning travelers, our hundred room luxury hotel exper expertly fuses modern technology, personalized experiences and authentic cultural immersion to create a truly unparalleled parallel retreat from the moments guests arrive, they are welcome into a world of bespoke services and innovative amenities, all meticulously designed to cater to the individual preferences and needs. It was like really like well written, etc. And then it gave like, you know, their top 10 bespoke guest experiences, state of the art technology. Yep. Incredible. I said, rewrite that in half the number of words. <laughs> and so it did it in half the number of words. So it was a little tighter. And then I said, Okay, you're a branding executive who has been given the description and location on a beach in Southern California, and you're being paid to name this hotel, give us four ideas came up with terrible ideas. SoCal <laughs> Serenity Retreat, Pacific Sands Haven, Coastal Bliss Retreat, Azure <laughs> Shoreline Sanctuary. I said, please do that again and come up with one word names. Microsoft sponsored number four. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it came up with <laughs> Wavecrest, Sunhaven, Tide Song, and Beach Lux. Those are much better. Much yeah, better. Those are much like, better. Not terrible. Yeah. Yeah. And then I said, give me four more, but none of the names should include beach, water, or wave concepts. Because I was like, that's too obvious. Oh, I like Elysian. Yeah. That's good. Let's go with that Zephoria, one. Zephoria, <laughs> Elysian, Solsti, Eden Vista. And this is where Vista. I left off in this insanity. <laughs> yeah. So, Jacob, can I challenge something that you said? You said 30% more efficient. Yeah. If you ask someone on your team to do that, that's more than a day of work, including the back and forth with you. I would say an average college educated person getting paid the average national salary for an operations position or an administrative assistant position, you know, like yep. a non programming non sales position is 60,000 a year 70,000 a year, which if you divide by yep. 2000, you know, is, you know, something in the range of 30 to $50, right? Uh, yeah, that's 50 hours, I think they would say 50 hours of work to put that presentation together. And to get that level of output, because you would be yep. starting from zero, you would basically surf the web for 20 hours 
you would write down all your ideas. You would go eat a bunch of bagels and donuts and you'd have come have a, a meeting with you. And then you'd say, oh, that's too long. Make it shorter. I don't like these names. Come back. You'd, yes. you'd have these each, each time that's it's a 50, 30 minutes is, interaction with you. Yeah. 50 hours of work. I put it at times 40 yeah. bucks, is $2,000, maybe a hundred hours of work. Yeah, to get this and then to forget about asking him to come up with names you know that's like a very specific thing that's an agency we charge you twenty thousand yeah. dollars for those four names at the end i think um, yeah and so and it's not 30 percent more efficient i think it's 300 percent. yeah i could be wrong then i wonder if the gains are sustained because these feel like early gains so now my question back to you sonny is are these like massive gains 300% gains for the first year of AI, and then we get to 30% a year? Or is it compounding and 300 turns into 3000? That's a good question. I hadn't thought about it. But my my guess is, you See, know, this is sort hard. Of, well, when the iPhone first came out, right? And even to this day, and we don't get as many Ubers and Airbnbs, but mm. it's still it's still it's compounding on itself. Yeah. And we're 10 plus years. I mean, we're 15 years in. Why are we saying 10, right? Yeah. We're 15 years in and an iPhone still compounds. Crazy. Yeah. I, so I, I think mean, it you, compounds. This is, back to, this is back to the whole thing. With, like human beings are really bad at um, being able to see like the com you know, compounded growth charts. Like we, you know, exponential growth when, when it's sitting right in front of us over the three months or six months. We can't imagine how fast this thing's going to grow. We, 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 you know, our brains are not wired to understand the curve. Yeah, that's really, yeah. We have an evolutionary, not an exponent, exponential mindset. Exactly. Exactly. We we only understand evolution, and even evolution took thousands of years well, for humans to accept the time. idea that we evolved from primates and primates evolved from, you know, reptiles or whatever. I don't know what the exact forking was. That took thousands of years for us to understand this. We, we, we have we have three billion people, three to four billion people who are, I would say, you know, activated in the global economy. So they have an internet connection. They have a, you know they have access. Like it's a highly networked place. Like we think about this, right? Like a hundred years ago, I mean, the most connected network of people would be maybe people living in New York or. Or London, or like, and that's maybe yeah. uh, maybe hundred thousand people, you know. And that was like a network because it was it was separated by by obviously distance, uh, and maybe you know once the telephone and came knowledge. up, now, yeah, and and, and, exactly, knowledge, and yeah. access. And when the telephone came up, now you had like a wider connection, uh, so you could access people, uh, you know, over space and time quicker. But that you know, it, it took airplanes. For, it took for airplanes, transport. Now we've got now we've got this. I mean. This We've is got thinking. Uh, this this is like taking the number of people. Like if, if you like work out some sort of let's just say for example, you said the number was um, you know um, let's say it's a hundred million people twenty years ago squared was the number mm. right now it's you know, and then you bring the internet in that's what it was right now, now you've got three billion people squared like that number is orders of magnitude more than a hundred million squared. It's insane. But what's really going to happen here, I think it's such a great point, um, is th think about the, the impact of giving somebody internet access, then high speed internet access. Now you give them this. So for somebody who's a knowledge worker, I, I said, oh, 30% more efficient. Uh, and Sonny said 3000. And now imagine you are a person 300, 300%, sorry, 300%. Now you're a person in Sao Paulo. And you just, you had low speed access sometimes, flaky internet access. Now imagine you get a Starlink connection and you've got a hundred megabits uh, down and you get ChatGPT4. And instead of you having to figure stuff out, you start asking it questions like this and you ask it, okay, how do I create a hotel chain? How do I name a hotel? You start asking these questions or how do I code? And it starts teaching how to code. This is crazy. Like those people are going to experience they're going to be comparable to somebody who is educated in New York at NYU or in Boston at Harvard, like the ability to close the gap in knowledge and ability it, and network is crazy. Just like LinkedIn made it possible for, I get people emailing yep. me from Hong Kong or Australia because they found me on LinkedIn. But yeah, this is, it's hard to well, comprehend well, well, what happens like when a billion people have access to this. 
So if, if, if you take it down to like the biological compute stack of the human being, right? We've got this like ability to store data in our brains, and then we have the ability to compute data. And so what's happened over the first, you know, with the internet in the first 20 or 30 years, I'd say, let's say the last 20 or 30 years on the internet was that we basically offloaded, and with, with mobile as well, we've offloaded the, the storage layer to the internet. So whatever you wanted to know something, you didn't have to remember, remember all these facts and figures. You go to Wikipedia, you search, you find this information. And we just did the compute on that. That's how we did research. We like get you know gather some facts, take hours and hours to find the data, and then we go interpret that and see what it produces, and then we'd like apply it in our lives, whether it's business or personal. What 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 OpenAI and ChatGPT and AI in general is doing is is basically you know t- the compute function for the human brain is being now is, is the same process is happening to that also being, happening to the storage. Yeah. So so now we've got storage on the internet, and now we've got compute. On open AI. So the human brain now is not, it's no longer about doing compute. Like we're not going to sit there. I'm not going to take a spreadsheet and do the graphs and do the analysis and try and figure out the financials of a company. Heck no. Yeah. I'm going to take the company financials, stick it into open AI and say, okay, this public company, I, you know, uh, w- you know, based upon Buffett's methodology, how would you value this if you saw sales growing at 20% faster than the current projections? It would do all the calcs for me. It would come back and say, yeah, actually, you know, based upon the, you know, Buffett style of investing, this is a great investment. I know it's a really shitty investment. And that happens in minutes. I can analyze the entire wow. company's financial statements in minutes. And oh, no, like, so, the, so, yeah. so, so let me just finish the point. So what's really, mo- what's really happening with the human brain right now. So we've, we've offloaded storage. We've offloaded. Uh, or we offloading uh, you compute. Know, compute. We're starting the to one. The, the third thing which we're not offloading and we shouldn't, and and this is where the the debate gets in is is um, decision making, right? Because the, the, these systems are not making decisions for us. Morality, can, ethics, decision making. Exactly, exactly. Yep. So morality, ethics, Nailed decision it. making, and then and then when you have this, like now, it always says this is what it looks like. This this co- company looks like a good investment. Now you make the decision: Do I want to deploy my capital in there? Now you can automate that eventually. But that's, you know, and, and the financial decisions are the easy one, but the morality stuff is where we, we're going to have these conversations. Let me uh, go to you, Sonny, in a second, but I just want to give a shout out to yeah. Cora's Poe. And if you, you can log into it the we- at the web now, it's poe.com, and they have something called Sage. But they also have GTP4, Claude Plus, Claude Instant, Nevis AI. They got everything here, and you can create bots. It's They're really cooking with oil over there. Um and it's, uh, I asked it, what are the major trends in luxury hotels to try to, you know, do the, the Cora data set? And it gave me really great stuff. But what they do is they highlight keywords, which is really interesting. So again, you get technology, local experiences, social responsibility. Um, and then I said, okay, um, give me 10 specific trends around points two and four. And I said, sure, here are 10 specific trends around personalization and technology. Again, the same as I was doing in the other chat GPT4 instance. Um, it gave me all these things. And so then I just clicked on smart room systems because I, I didn't know that smart room systems was a category. So I, I click smart room ses- systems and it appended, tell me more about to that. And uh, it started explaining, you know, one of the key features, adjust the room's lighting, temperature, all that stuff. Um, and um, y- it gives, gives you prompts now. So it's actually telling you what to ask next. And this is really yeah. getting interesting. So it's it, this is precog. If you watch uh, Minority Report, Sonny, where it like knows you're <laughs> yep. going to commit a crime, it knows yep, what yep. you want to do next. Uh, the next, yep, yep. and it kind of gives you the next one. Uh, what are some examples? Of smart room systems. How they prov- and now you can say what are examples and boom, you can just keep Philip Hugh. So now I'm like, you start thinking about the research again. Back to your point of like how many hours this would take. Um, we're going to have companies that were 20 people will be five, you know, or they'll be able yep. to do twice as much. So the way I com- told my team Sunday night and this morning was if you're not using this, like you're falling behind. And I said, offload as much as you can to these systems. And let's meet with twice as many founders. Like let's actually spend more time talking to founders as opposed to researching stuff. All right, let's wrap up here. Any final thoughts, Sunny? We got Vinny's. I want to get your final thoughts, Sunny. How is this impacting the work you do every day and how you're looking at your entrepreneurial career and running your own company, Sunny? Yeah, I mean, I think we've touched on the major points, but like for us, we think about enabling this within the enterprise. That's our primary focus, right? So we think that's really important. And how do we do that in an efficient way such that enterprises can harness this? 
it's not as straightforward for m- most enterprises to just go to chat GPT four um, just yet, but you know, we're, we're working on that problem alongside it. I think too, um, what we have to kind of focus in on is uh, how does, how do you know what it's telling you is accurate? And I think we, you know, saw a few examples of that where we're kind of questioning what it, what it's told us. Where we started today's conversation, we can see if you give it a data set, it can be very, you know, kind of definitive about it. And if not, you have to be careful on what it's telling you and where it's pulling it from. Your example of the crawl was not sort of, um, you know, using Vinny's framework of memory and compute. It wasn't doing either. It was kind of doing the the cheating thing of humans. And so Mm. I think, uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity here. And what everyone should think about is, um, the speed at which you can move in this environment, right? I think, and the speed forces you to basically use the technology to its maximum capability. You have the folks, you can run literally 30% faster every week, compounding week after week, if you embrace these tools, and you use them. Um, Stop what you're doing. If you hear my voice, this is not a drill. I know, like, in technology, we get really excited and we hype stuff up. You know, mobile, broadband, crypto, everything, VR, AR, we hype stuff up, we're excited about it. All of that stuff, you know, had, you know, different levels of impact. This is different. This is just very different. Um, And it's compounding at a pace that I think is a self-fulfilling prophecy on the way to AGI. I mean, we're getting to artificial general intelligence. It's so clear. I mean, we're you're beating the Turing test already. Like you're smashing it, beating it around like a dead mouse. I mean, you can't tell the di- if I if I took this and I put it into a presentation and I gave you that pitch on your luxury hotel, you would think like a bunch of McKinsey people spent three months on it. And not even McKinsey, Jacob, if we can pull up one more thing, I know we're running short on time here. We won't, we won't listen to it, but maybe we can drop it in the notes. But, um, th- this developer basically built an entire Google Translate, but that works. It takes into account two of these trends. We're talking about this, you know, this, uh, uh, AI voice treatments. And so what it does is it takes his voice and what he's asking. Um, translates it and then speaks it in the language that he's looking for. And he's got a link to the program here. It's all open source. Mm -hmm. This one person basically built an entire Google translate that speaks out the translated version of what you're asking for in his voice. So I can do this week in startups as in Spanish, but it would be in my voice. In Spanish, it would be in your voice. That's bonkers. Yes. And he built that and all the code is there. And it's just incredible. Yeah. And think about the armies of people this would have, you know, this does take at, you know, the Googles of the world or, you know, metas well, of the world. And it wouldn't be done. I mean, that's, I've been pitched many years for taking this podcast and now all in and making a German language version or a Spanish language version. Yep. And they're like, we hire act voice actors to redo your podcast every week. And for 500 bucks or a thousand bucks, we can make another language version of it and i'm like yep yeah and they're like you can sell advertising i'm like i don't have the time to do this it seems like a lot of work but if i could press a button and take this podcast yep and put it into 10 languages and then have 10 different websites with it i would do it yeah for sure i would do it yeah and i would pay yeah, 50 I'll send bucks. You a link to the tool i pay 50 bucks to do that yeah. i wouldn't pay 500 though um yep. so if somebody wants to take this episode and translate it into spanish and then use our voices I would pay 50 bucks for that and you could do it every week and I'd pay you 50 bucks a week. I mean, I literally might do all, you know, 250 episodes a year. It would only be, it wouldn't be that much money, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Not that much. 10,000 bucks. I, for 10,000 bucks, I would translate this all into Spanish every year. So there, I mean, that's a business opportunity for somebody. That's not chump change if you can automate it. Vinny, any plugs? Any plugs? You earned your, you earned your, I mean, you, you earned your lunch here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I mean, obviously excited about what we're doing at Waitroom, um, and uh, really would love to see tell people, people about what that it. is. Yeah, yeah. Well, Wait- Waitroom is basically a video conferencing platform that's going to be fully AI driven. We're launching our features in in May. Uh, the AI features. The, the, our first feature will be probably catch up, which means that if you jump into a call late with your colleagues, it gives you a summary of what just happened before you got there. 
Uh, and I think that that's going to be rolled up. I mean, the, the features we're rolling out the next month or two is going to be pretty awesome. So check out the website, waitroom.com. Um, I will say that in building Waitroom now, on uh, we're using OpenAI. Um, it's really interesting because as we start working with companies to understand what their businesses are about and integrating into their Salesforce and Notion, et cetera, we may have to start building our own custom uh, LLM to just, just mm. basically understand how to take conversations and, and meld them into um, you know, something more useful to the company because you need context around what the company does and train, training the language to understand like, the company better. We're using OpenAI right now. Maybe it evolves so fast we don't need to, but it's something where, where, mm. that you, when you're thinking about building features, you have to ask yourself, is it something you're building which is LLM sort of agnostic or is it is that core to your business? So I, I'm really interested to see what happens over time, where the companies build their own ones, or you know, take an open source one, fork it, and and build some customized ones, or you use the standard. I mean, it'll you know, be if there's a cloud available. Like, why am I mean, unless you are Dropbox or YouTube, like you're going to rack your own storage. But if you're below Dropbox or Box, you know, you're going to just use well, cloud there's storage. Da- there's data privacy issues as well, and I know that OpenAI is trying to deal with that, but some companies probably wouldn't feel comfortable with. Yeah, you know, so you do on prem. Yeah, yeah. You just do on so, on prem exactly. cloud. And, and, so, and then, and then, if you do that, then you have to have your own LLM because you you, you can't really use Open AI for on prem. Maybe you can. Do they have on prem, Sunny? Do they know? do. They they okay. they have versions now that allow you to do. Sunny, that any as plugs? Well. Any plugs? Um, yeah, you know, like uh, definitive AI. A lot of stuff that we're looking at here today. We're just enabling that within the enterprise. So reach out if you want to do that with your Everybody own. Everybody, we'll data. see you next time on this week in service. Bye bye.